Ed, what are we looking at right here? That's a model of the Rigel aircraft. And the Rigel is a uh, heavy lift uh, aircraft, a heavy lift UAV actually, that's designed to be uh, unmanned. And uh, it's definitely not a toy. It's got a 30 foot wingspan. It's got a 30 uh, foot long fuselage. Uh, it's designed to take off and land vertically like a helicopter. Um, and designed to carry a very heavy load. So the real difference is that the aircraft itself uh, is, it, it, it acts a lot like a helicopter, but it can go where no other helicopter can go because it flies faster, farther, much more economically, and with a much heavier load than you could get on board a helicopter. And one big difference between that helicopter in the picture and, uh, and your vehicle is there's no pilot. Correct, there's a, there's a remote operator on the ground, uh, this size aircraft, we can, our maximum gross weight can go up to 8,400 pounds. Out of that is about a 6,000 pound payload. But the FAA rules say that we have to have a uh, at least somebody talking with F with air traffic control. So we do provide a remote pilot op uh, a remote operator for the air vehicle. And so it does have a system on board that's called a detect and avoid DAA system that can act autonomous uh, autonomously to avoid obstacles or other tra air traffic. Uh, if the operator doesn't do so. So it sends a notification to the operator saying, I've got traffic that's coming it's, you know, 20 miles away. And if it reaches a certain point and the operator hasn't done anything, the aircraft itself will move around the traffic and then move back to its uh, course. Well, and we are here at uh, the conference sponsored by Velodyne, so I assume there's sensors like LiDAR and other things in there then? There are, yes. There's, it's got a six sensor suite. Uh, and so the DAA, and so those are, that includes everything from a vision or camera-based system, excuse me, to a, uh, a LIDAR to a radar. Uh, it can actually, the radar can see out to almost 20 miles. Uh, it's got ADSB, it's got all sorts of TCAS. So it's, all these sensors are integrated together to provide a picture of the surrounding airspace, both in front and behind the aircraft and it knows what's out there, so it's, and it needs to do that to be able to fly. We can, we, our application of the FAA is to fly in any space that's out there, even into SFO if we need to, and the only way we can do that is with a detect and avoid system, and of course an operator that, that the air traffic control can say, turn left, turn right, you know, stay away from here, that kind of stuff. What makes it interesting is it can take off in a conventional mode, but land in vertical, or obviously take off vertical as well. That's correct. Yeah, it, it will. It's uh, so it has four fans, and the fans rotate. So when it's taking off and landing, like a helicopter, the fans are tilted up, and they provide all the lift uh, in takeoff and landing. But then once it starts, it'll start transitioning like a regular aircraft. The fans will tilt forward, where they're horizontal with the aircraft, providing nothing but thrust. And then all the lift is provided by the main wing, and it's very, very aerodynamically efficient. So we can fly very high speed, but very with very low drag and it makes the aircraft uh, use a lot less fuel. As a matter of fact, it's even a green, considered a green aircraft. It uses 66% less than a similar aircraft, uh, air cargo aircraft that just uses a turbine engine. And what makes that vertical landing so interesting is now you can get to places that you couldn't get with conventional aircraft, right? Or even maybe a helicopter? That's correct, yeah. Helicopters, uh, they, they serve a very good purpose. They carry people and cargo and everything else, but they're really a compromise with a lot of different things. Ours is strictly air cargo. We're not trying to carry people, but we're, we design the aircraft from the very start to be able to go very long distances. And not so much that the air cargo carriers are going to use, are going to do, you know, carry 6,000 pounds and go 1,000 miles, not necessarily. What they will do, though, is they'll, they'll, they'll fill up at home with the, 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 where the gas prices are good, so to speak, They'll fill up at home and they'll take a 6,000 pound load and go to one airport that may be 200, 250 miles away, un discharge cargo load up cargo and go to another one 250 miles away. So at the end of the day, they come back and they, they can still re refuel with the fuel that they get at home. So it really makes it much more economical to operate uh, in that instance. So yes, it's got a thousand nautical mile range, but in reality it's not. Very rarely will you see that, maybe in Alaska where they'll take off from Anchorage and go to the North Slope and drop off well casing and then have to come back. It, then it comes in handy there. But in reality, for the most part, you'll be going small distances a lot of times during the day. And that's really where air cargo companies make, uh, make bank, as we used to say when I was in the 135 world. <laughs> and so from a uh, cost per mile, does this start to compete with uh, long haul trucking or is it just different applications? Different applications, it's really designed to go where long haul trucking can't. 
uh, 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 I brought up the example earlier, but it was in Alaska, for example, only 17% of the communities there are serviced by roads. So that begs then, how do you get in and out? There's even been TV shows that have been made uh, about getting air cargo in and out of Alaska. Uh, but then there are a lot of place, communities in Alaska that don't even have runways. So how do you get them there? You know, How do you service them? One thing that they're starting to see more and more often is the fact that there's a lot of hazardous waste in these communities that they want to remove, but they can't because it's a, for example, car batteries. They can get, they can drive the car there, they can get batteries there and everything else, but the problem is getting all that hazardous waste out. Now it's, uh, even if they get it in and out by air, that hazardous waste because they have to fly specific routes, they have to have a waiver for the route, they have to have a waiver for the, and specially trained air crews, that's not required with one of these. They can land it in the middle of the city, load up all their hazardous waste and bring it back to a hazardous waste uh, processing facility that may be two, three, four hundred miles away. Um, it makes it a lot easier. So it sounds like the real comparison instead of long haul trucking, it should be with the traditional helicopter, right? I mean, is that kind of the economics of where you're looking to go? It is, I think, uh, again, we'll, we'll never be able to fly people. That's not our, our niche. But in reality, the uh, it's very much like a helicopter. We can go, I always tell people, but it's true, we can go higher, faster, farther than a helicopter with a much bigger load, which is true. Um, and that's what it's designed to do. But it's really designed to go to those places that helicopters can't. There are some places we can do it much more economically as well, both in fuel, acquisition costs, maintenance, all those things are really, there's a, a sweet spot there for us and it's well below even, even traditional cargo aircraft approaching what you would see in a long haul trucking uh, price line, uh, price point. Wow, so that's uh, significantly cheaper. You don't need to have skilled people on site to run the thing, right? Because you're remotely uh, doing this, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, you can keep the aircraft operating 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week in theory. You just put fuel in it, and you've got you, all you're doing is changing the pilot. So even in the middle of a flight, if it's at 22,000 feet and a pilot's shift is over, you one pilot gets up, the other pilot sits down, takes over from there, and lands it and continues on. You can have three shifts of pilots a day. You don't have to put the pilots up in a hotel. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to provide them with transportation. They're doing it out of their home, so they're and and the FAA is actually uh, in the very beginning. The, one of the things we're talking about with is with them is to be able to alleviate pilot shortage. It doesn't require a, a, it only requires a commercial um, instrument certification. So a lot of pilots out there who want to become airline transport pilots, they can get they can log their hours flying this aircraft, and then later on go take the test for become an airline pilot. But originally. Uh, the, the traditional method was just for a pilot to go um, and become a uh, get his commercial in, an instrument uh, and then become a an air uh, a flight instructor and then have to fly another tw uh, 1,250 hours mm -hmm. before they could take the test. Which over maybe several years they finally get to that point. This gets them there a lot quicker. If they were flying eight hours a day for five days a week, you know they were doing 40 hours a week. They're going to hit their uh, 1,500 hours very, very quickly. So, right. so how does the uh, uh, aircraft communicate back to these remote operators? I mean, because there's a lot of data potentially that these things are generating. So it actually goes through a satellite. Um, we talk to, the, the pilot talks to the aircraft via a satellite, so it actually sends a signal up to the satellite. Satellite uh, sends it down to the aircraft, and then the aircraft uh, talks to air traffic control via the onboard radios. So that's how it does it. And there's a slight amount of latency, but it's not even a second or two seconds. Um, and so that's, it's just as though the pilot were sitting in the aircraft. He has the same displays, same maps. It's even a, 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 a computer generated image for where he is. It's always clear, daylight and clear on that computer generated image. So he knows where the aircraft is. It's always for him, VFR, uh, visual flight rules inside the, sim, inside the uh, control uh, uh, area. but on the aircraft it may be the worst weather you could possibly imagine. So it sounds like you're kind of regenerating the visual image uh, so you're not necessarily sending all the data that you would have from a 4k camera or something is that correct? Correct as long as we have position information and accurate positions so we actually use four separate methods to provide the aircraft position in case we have we, we do that for redundancy so we have primary and then triple redundancy behind that or quadruple redundancy really but uh, but that provides us most of the information so even if we lost communication with the ground for whatever reason a radio is, is 
inoperable or, you know, we hit a bird and the antennas come off. Uh, not so the satellite antenna. We'll still send position information to the satellite. And we can pick up a telephone and call air traffic control and say, here's the aircraft, you know, what do you want us to do? And then it's instantaneous. So there's no lag at all. The aircraft, the pilot's always talking to air traffic control. And then you're going to be launching the first full-scale model in terms of at least a test flight later this year, right? Correct. Well, uh, the rollout ceremony will be in December, and we're hoping to start flight tests then in January. And so when, when, so when do you expect uh, you know, FAA certification and, and rolling out as a service? Um, we're, we're hoping for FAA certification right away, Chris. Uh, typically, it's a five-year process. Uh, we've done some things because we're not flying people on board. Uh, we're going to be able to move things a little bit forward. Uh, we're saying right around the 2023 time frame, but, but things are actually progressing very well. We've even had the FAA that said, we think we can beat that time frame to, before 2023. So we're very optimistic. We think we can get there. So do you see yourself as a service company? Are you going to be selling the planes or are you going to be actually that service provider, uh, you know, flying as a service, cargo as a service? No, it's uh, no actually that's, we, we build airplanes, we build great airplanes, but it's, um, you know, I don't want to be the uh, ch uh, Chinese food restaurant slash Mexican food restaurant. We want to just build airplanes. And so that we and we're very lucky. We've so far, we've gotten a, a, a pretty hefty order book, a $53 million sales order book because we're only selling airplanes. Um, I think it's leave it up to the companies like the UPSs and, uh, you know, you, um, uh, the Postal Service and those guys to deliver the mail, so to speak, sure. will do, will deliver the aircraft that'll, that'll do that. And it's it's really, that's what we know best and that's what we're going to stick with. We used, I used my experience in one, from flying 135, part 135 cargo, uh, to help design the aircraft and how it's used and everything, and even the use cases. But in reality, uh, there are people out there that have done this many more years than I have, have done it a lot. And, and this is really their only business. They don't go into making aircraft. We don't go into moving uh, cargo. So, so are you guys actually going to be a manufacturer as well, or we are? Yeah, we're going to manufacture. We're the manufacturer of the aircraft. So we designed it. We're going to manufacture it, and then we will sell it to, to the. We're kind of the um, the Airbus of of the cargo aircraft world, and that we just build aircraft. We'll leave it to somebody else to do the cargo carriage. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing these uh, in the sky. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it.